For the price of a cup of coffee, join my Patreon. The page includes audio documentaries not available on my YouTube channel. Link below in the description. Thanks for watching. In 1968, after the release of the White Album in November, the Beatles were falling apart. Paul believed getting back to live performance would bring them back together. The plan was to write and rehearse 14 new songs in 17 days. They would then perform the songs in front of a live studio audience, which would be broadcast on TV. The rehearsals would be recorded for a television special directed by Michael Lindsay Hogg. What became known as the Get Back Sessions were booked for January 1969, but time was finite. Ringo had to start filming The Magic Christian on the 24th of January. The producer of The Magic Christian, Dennis O'Dell, had booked Twickenham Studios to film until the end of May, so he gave stage one to the Beatles to rehearse. They began on the 2nd of January and were booked to do live performances of songs they had wrote on the 19th and 20th of January. George and John are first to arrive with Yoko who sits on a piano bench watching. Ringo follows shortly after. They begin rehearsing Don't Let Me Down. Paul arrives mid-song, picks up his bass and doubts about their chosen rehearsal space Twickenham start immediately. Already the four are annoyed by the nightmare of actually getting to Twickenham Studios with the London traffic. Director Michael Lindsay Hogg then requests they turn down their amps because the noise is drowning out their conversation. They continue rehearsing songs, then mess around singing Bob Dylan and Chuck Berry covers. The open film studio during January was cold and damp. Ringo later described it as like rehearsing in a big barn. Paul expresses worries to the sound engineers about the sound quality of the planned live performance when heard on TV. Different venues are discussed for the performance, including an amphitheatre in Libya. Paul rejects the idea, stating, Ringo doesn't want to go abroad. He put his foot down. Then he jokes, so us and Jimmy Nichols might go abroad. They continue rehearsing songs, and John states every time he sings Don't Let Me Down, the vocals are so high it hurts his voice. A few days in, they express their anxiety about the live performance in front of an audience. With a sense of urgency, Paul and George begin arguing about how they should be rehearsing a song, George's improvisational style being the issue. During the argument, John takes Paul's side, saying, Whoever's song it is, should give the orders. The group later discuss what direction they should go in, with George stating, Things have never been the same since Mr Epstein passed away. Paul continues to try and motivate the group and keep the project moving. The group still can't make a decision on a location for the live performance on the 19th. They consider a venue in Libya with the audience given free boat rides over. George argues it's impractical to transport the whole studio audience over. Paul states, That's not our problem how they get there. John echoes Paul repeating, That's not our problem. George then replies, Of course it's our problem. George then adds, I think the idea of a boat is completely insane. The idea is forgotten about. They are now six days in and things aren't going well. While rehearsing, Linda talks to director Michael Lindsay Hogg. She states, I like Ringo. I feel the most comfortable around him. Michael replies, me too. The Beatles continue working while the cameras buzz like mosquitoes by their heads. John, unable to concentrate, makes little contribution. As they break for lunch, George tells John, I think I'll be leaving the band now. John, confused, replies, when? George answers, now. And with that, 
George leaves the studio and quits the Beatles. After lunch, one Beatle down, George's space now empty, John announces, so pissed, poor lads, I don't know what we're coming back here for. John then jokingly states, okay George, take it, and they begin playing wildly. Yoko then takes George's seat and begins wailing into the microphone. Afterwards, Michael Lindsay Hogg suggests for the live performance on the 19th, they could say George was sick. He then asks if any of the Beatles have left as seriously as this. John replies, well, Ringo. The entire group, including George Martin, sit down together and John states, so cats and kittens, what are we gonna do? Paul suggests they do the live performance at the Cavern Club. George Martin states, location isn't really the problem now. They then decide to arrange a meeting with George, hoping to convince him to rejoin the band. Two days later, they arrange to meet at Ringo's house. During the meeting, John doesn't talk, Yoko speaks for him. Negotiations break down during their conversation and George storms out the room, slamming the door behind him. The three Beatles agree to return to the studio and carry on rehearsals without George. On Monday, Ringo is the only Beatle to arrive at Twickenham Studios. Neil Aspinall phones John and Paul to ask if they're coming. Ringo asks director Michael Lindsay Hogg, Do you have enough footage for a good documentary? Michael replies, If we tell it like it is, we've got a very good documentary. As they're talking, Paul arrives. Paul states that it's difficult writing music with John now he's with Yoko. He also says they can't expect John not to bring Yoko to meetings. Neil Aspinall adds, but there must be some compromise. Michael Lindsay Hogg jokes, I thought the other day I might leave, but then I thought they wouldn't notice. After that, Paul takes a phone call from John, who confirms he's on his way in. When John arrives, they get word George has gone to Liverpool and won't be back till Wednesday. At this point, the live show is changed from the 19th and 20th to the 26th and 27th. At this point, sets for the Magic Christian begin to arrive. Rehearsals are cancelled and another meeting with George is planned at Ringo's house. As part of George's terms to return, the live TV performance is abandoned, but not the live recording. They also decide to leave Twickenham and rehearse at the Apple Basement Studios Magic Alex Mardas is designing. George agrees to return, and whilst the equipment is packed up, George and Glyn Johns travel to check out the new Apple Studios. They're shocked at what they find. Magic Alex's setup is disastrous. Equipment is sent urgently from EMI to Apple Basement Studios. It takes two days to install. After two days, the studio still isn't ready and the camera crew are refused permission to film in Apple. Shooting resumes a day later. After a discussion, the TV special is cancelled and instead they decide to use the footage for their next film. John is then presented with Magic Alex's idea of an electric bass with a rotating neck. The group laugh as they ask, how do you tune it? John states, tell him to build a prototype. Recording then begins, starting with Dig a Pony, followed by I've Got a Feeling, and then Don't Let Me Down. Billy Preston, who's in London for a TV appearance, stops by Apple. John explains they're recording every song live and they need a piano player. Billy agrees to play for the record. His presence lifts their spirits and they're able to get on track with the project. During recording, an anvil is delivered to the studio. Paul jokingly states, it's just to remind you of Maxwell's silver hammer all the time. During rests, the group talk about Billy Preston and adding other members to the Beatles. 
George says he could ask Bob Dylan to join the group and he would. Paul replies, it's bad enough with four. Recording continues and director Michael Lindsay Hogg pushes the group to decide for a venue for the performance. With no time left, they decide to do the performance on the roof of the Apple building. The first worry they have is the roof won't support the weight of all the equipment plus the crew. Back in the studio they record Let It Be, The Long and Winding Road, Get Back and I've Got a Feeling. Due to the bad weather the performance on the rooftop is delayed a day. They continue recording Don't Let Me Down. Later that day their new manager Alan Klein arrives at Apple and they go upstairs to have their first meeting with him. They talk late into the night. The next day the group give their thoughts on him. Glyn John states, He's a strange guy. He really is very strange. John adds, Fantastic though. Then states, They're all hustlers. Glyn John goes on to talk about Klein's personality, stating, He'll ask you a question and you're halfway through answering it and if he doesn't like the answer, or if it's not really what he wanted to hear, he'll change the subject right in the middle of a sentence. Ringo states at least they now have a con man who's on their side. So far they have seven songs finished, and with time running out, they realise they won't be able to reach 14. Paul admits they originally planned to perform the songs from the White Album live before deciding to write new ones. John also states he's having trouble getting through the songs as he's so tired. All four members other than George are happy to perform on the roof of Apple. So far they have a rough list of songs for the album. They read as follow. I've got a feeling, don't let me down, the long and winding road, let it be, for you blue, two of us, dig a pony, currently titled all I want is you. Across the Universe, Maxwell's Silver Hammer, One After 909, She Came In Through The Bathroom Window, currently titled Bathroom Window, and All Things Must Pass. Ten cameras will be used to film the live performance. Five are set up on the rooftop. One camera is put on a building opposite. Three cameras will be on the street, and one in the reception room at Apple. In Apple's basement studio, Glyn Johns and George Martin wait to record the performance. The Beatles have a meeting in a room upstairs. They have doubts about the performance. They head out to the roof and Paul jumps up and down, referencing their earlier worries the roof would collapse. The performance begins with Get Back. Down on the street, crowds of people gather. They know it's the Beatles, but are confused to what they're doing. The second song they perform, Don't Let Me Down. Down on the street, people begin to complain the music is too loud. As they begin their third song, I've Got a Feeling, police arrive at Apple. The police state they've had 30 complaints. It's a breach of the peace and demand the music be turned down, otherwise people will be arrested. They attempt to stall the police in reception. As the police wait, the group begin their fourth song, One After 909. The police realise the group are performing on the roof and the noise isn't coming from the studio as the group begin their fifth song, Dig a Pony. As they finish, John informs Michael Lindsay Hogg his hands are getting too cold to play a chord. They perform I've Got a Feeling again for their fifth song as the police continue to wait in reception. Halfway through the song, the police ask to be taken up to the roof. The police arrive on the roof as they're performing their sixth song, Don't Let Me Down, again. The group take no notice of the police, other than George, who watches them the whole time. At this time, Police Sergeant David Hendrick arrives at Apple. He's told he can't go up to the roof because it's overweighted. The group, aware they'll be asked to stop, Go straight from Don't Let Me Down into Get Back Without a Break. George continues to stare at the police. Mal Evans begins talking to the group and George is audible through the mics when replying. John stops playing 
and turns around to face Mal while Paul continues the song with Ringo. After that, they turn around and continue playing. At that point, the owner of the building opposite knocks the door of Apple to complain about the noise. After the song finishes, the group take off their instruments and head down to the Apple basement studio. They listen to the recording of the performance and Paul states they can record more songs for the album. George replies, there won't be more rooftops, it was really bad. Paul states they will record everything else in the studio. They then inform the instruments will take some time to bring from the roof and set up. They agree to return tomorrow and record. The next day they return and record two of us, the long and winding road and the film ends as they play Let It Be. After all was complete, the four Beatles were not happy with the recordings and the Get Back album was scrapped. Instead, Paul contacted George Martin and suggested they all get together and make an album, in Paul's words, the way we used to do it. While recording the album, George felt as if they were reaching the end of the line. By September 1969, the Beatles had released Abbey Road. Lennon hadn't featured on half of the tracks, but he publicly praised it. He stated, This next Beatles album is really something. John and Yoko's heroin addiction at this point was so severe, neither of them knew whether it was day or night. The two decided to kick their habit. According to Ono, they refused to go to hospital because they didn't want the publicity. The two went through withdrawals without any medication to ease their symptoms, also known as going cold turkey. Lennon at one point had ordered Yoko to tie him to a chair. The event was documented in Lennon's next song, Cold Turkey. Lennon suggested it could be the Beatles' next single. The other three members showed little interest. Harrison McCartney felt it was neither stylistically or lyrically a Beatles song. Annoyed by this, Lennon decided to release it without them. In the UK, Cold Turkey was banned due to its drug references. It didn't make much impact on the charts. Around this time, the group were invited to see a screening of the Get Back footage that had been taken almost a year previous. They were unsure of what to do with the unused project and their manager Alan Klein suggested they release the documentary under a new name along with the soundtrack. For the title, the long and winding road was considered before they settled on Let It Be. Klein also mentioned Phil Spector could produce the soundtrack. Paul agreed to meet him to discuss further matters. They would never meet. In January 1970, McCartney, Harrison and Starr, minus Lennon who was on vacation, entered EMI Studios. They began work on two tracks for the Let It Be album, I Me Mine and Let It Be. When Lennon returned from vacation, he recorded Instant Karma with Phil Spector producing. It was released February 6th. After this, John took all the Get Back tapes and gave them to Phil Spector. By the time McCartney found out about this, it was months later and Phil Spector had finished most of the production. Even the front cover art was finished. A collage of the four in January 1969 had been compiled. The photo that was originally intended was the four replicating their Please Please Me cover. McCartney was livid. When George Martin heard the finished product, he famously stated that Phil Spector had overproduced it. Spector commented later in the year, stating he didn't consider George Martin in the same league as him. He also mentioned when he first got the Get Back tapes, they were in a terrible condition. Not long after, McCartney released a questionnaire press release cementing the breakup of the Beatles. The newspaper headline read, Paul is quitting the Beatles. Lennon was enraged when he read the newspaper. He told Rolling Stone, we were all hurt that he didn't tell us what he was going to do. John also believed Paul had only used the publicity of the Beatles breakup to sell his first solo record. McCartney phoned Lennon after the headlines hit and simply stated, 
I'm doing what you and Yoko were doing. McCartney was released and did well commercially. One critic said the album was casual and stated, anything that comes into his head he thinks is worth having. The Let It Be album was released not long after. The film hit theatres at virtually the same time. Knowing it was the final Beatles record caused many critics to trash the album. One called it a cheap epitaph. Rolling Stone magazine echoed George Martin's thoughts that the record was overproduced. Another dismissed the album as a bunch of tapes missing the Beatles' spark. Despite the criticisms, the album fared way better than the documentary. The Let It Be film was ripped apart by critics. One stated, Paul chatters incessantly, even when it seems none of the others are listening. From the project, Alan Klein managed to bank a profit of six million for Apple. Ironically, Let It Be had been recorded as an attempt by McCartney to bring the group back together. His thought being a return to their rock and roll sound would bring new life to the band, yet it was released as their swan song. <laughs> 